Hi guys! So this week I thought instead of doing a painting tutorial for you, I would instead uh, talk about some common mistakes or problems people seem to have when they're painting and then kind of address ways that you can deal with them. And this is kind of prompted by the fact that I get asked a lot by people for feedback on how they're painting or how they can, you know, do things differently to get better results. And I find it very difficult, I guess, to give people advice on a personal level, you know, because I don't really want to be mean, but also, of course, the way I would maybe do something uh, is not necessarily how other people would want to do it because, you know, I probably, I mean, I, what I might want to do might be more time consuming or more complicated or difficult than what they're really interested in, you know, tackling on their models. But what I want to do here, rather than kind of going into step by step sort of instructions for how to improve something is more to say, well, here are some issues that I see a lot and here are ways to kind of fix them in very general terms. And I'm going to look at some problems that I think are more probably things that you have as a beginner when you're starting out painting, but then also look at a few things that I think are also a problem for more advanced painters. And then I'm just going to give you more some ideas about, well, what you, what you could kind of generally, I guess, do instead to get better results. But getting, but doing that won't necessarily uh, be dependent on your skill level. So, you know, I'm hoping that a lot of the things here are, you can really use, you know, wherever you kind of are as a painter. Okay, so the first thing I want to start out talking to you about is brushes. And I know that's something I hammer on all the time in my videos about how important it is, but I'm just going to do it again because people keep asking me about it, even though I've talked about it a lot. And I think it's just something that deserves to be emphasized over and over and over again as much as possible that the uh, quality of your brushes is one of the most fundamentally important things you can do to make sure that you get um, a good results, and I think it's one of the it is one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're painting is just not investing in good brushes. So I'll try to give you an extreme example of what is wrong with a cheap brush. So like you know you go to Hobby Lobby or someplace like that, you buy sort of a bag, a value pack of the cheapest kind of brushes you can find. Uh, so what's wrong with these things? Well, okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll and I'm not going to talk too much about the quality because they're generally going to be pretty shittily made, but in terms of how that really affects the results you get when you're painting, uh, generally speaking, they're going to be made out of really cheap uh, synthetic fibers. And I'm not saying how synthetic fibers are bad, but these are going to be really cheap ones probably in brushes like that. And synthetic, cheap synthetic fibers are bad because they're inferior when it comes to, you generally inferior when it comes to sort of waking up and uh, holding paint and then at the same time allowing you to then release it in a smooth, even sort of flowing stroke. And when you're painting, and the smaller the thing you are that you're painting, the more critical that a good, smooth, even stroke uh, becomes. On a bigger surface, obviously, you don't notice it as much, but when you're working really small, you've got to have these smooth, even strokes. And the fact that you're not retaining uh, paint very well is problematic because you're going to be having to dip it in your brush way more than if you have a better brush, you know, that holds the paint a lot better. Uh, beyond that, they're often not very well shaped. Uh, it's really important for miniature painting that your brush comes to a nice, smooth, um, even tip so that you can do really fine work very well. And additionally, of course, brushes that are not well shaped or well formed, they tend to lose what shape they do have very quickly. They'll tend to split and fray. And you don't, you, I don't have to tell you how many people I get complaints saying, my brush is always splitting and the hairs are always turning out and fraying. It's really frustrating. It makes painting hard. And what can I do about that? Well, the main answer is don't buy such cheap brushes. That's the number one reason you get that problem is because you are buying shitty brushes, honestly. Or not good enough <laughs> brushes, I guess. So you're going to get that sort of splitting, sort of hairs not wanting to stay aligned in a nice point, uh, which makes painting, of course, a lot more difficult. And just the brushes are going to wear out a lot faster. Cheap brushes are just going to wear, they, they wear not, they don't wear as well. And you're going to start seeing more of those sort of splitting frame problems and 
issues with holding the point a lot sooner and they're going to be a lot more extreme than on better brushes. And it, it, it just, you know, all of those things are going to make um, getting good results an awful lot harder. And you may be saying at this point, well, I'm not stupid. I don't go like to Hobby Lobby and buy the cheapest, shittiest, like children's art brushes that I can or anything like that. But, and I understand that, but um, you have to keep in mind that just because you uh, don't buy the worst possible brushes out there doesn't necessarily mean you're buying good enough brushes. Like, say you you went to like your model shop or your gaming shop and you say buy your brushes there. Um, I know for sure that certain uh, large gaming companies that have their own line of hobby supplies and make brushes don't necessarily produce the ones that are really of the absolute best quality or actually are all made to the absolute best standard. So just by buying modeling or hobby branded brushes, you're not really guaranteeing that they're really well suited to what you're trying to do. In order to get really good brushes, what you need to do is go to an art supply store. And I know that can seem kind of overwhelming because you'll kind of probably be confronted with this huge wall of different brushes and not know what to look for. But what you should be doing is focusing on the watercolor brush section. And I know maybe that seems counterintuitive because there will be a section for acrylic brushes, but those are really kind of meant for totally different kind of acrylic painting than what we're doing as miniature painters. Watercolor brushes, on the other hand, are basically designed to be very absorbent, wick up a whole bunch of uh, paint, hold it sort of in the brush base, and then I'll release it in these very controlled fluid strokes. And that's basically what we need in miniature painting too, because we're thinning our acrylics down so much that they're basically uh, performing like watercolors. And within the watercolor brush section, you're going to see a whole bunch of different grades of, of brushes. Some of them are going to be cheap, and some of them are going to be really expensive. And you want to, in general, be looking at the most expensive brushes that you can afford. And I know price doesn't always signify quality, but in my experience, at least when it comes to brushes, paint, the price is very strongly related to the quality of the brush. So, you know, what are you getting then? I guess you're probably going to want to ask in the more expensive brushes, brushes versus the cheaper ones. Well, the more expensive brushes, mainly, besides being just better constructed by, you know, just with more eye for quality, are made of better materials. Uh, expensive watercolor brushes tend to be made out of uh, sable hair. So that's basically fur from, you know, the small fuzzy animals that are sometimes turned into fur coats. They basically harvest the hairs from those those little weasels, particularly from their tails, and they then shape a very small number of those into uh, the brush point. And the reason that they use the sable hair is because it's very soft, very smooth, and very fine, and it has extremely good sort of absorbency properties. It's very good at retaining and holding that moisture up in the brush like you want when you're doing this kind of thing. And because they're so soft and fine and smooth, you'll get a really nice, soft, even um, brush stroke. And you can achieve that, of course, with other uh, hairs as well. There's various synthetic fibers out there on the market, of course, that do similar things. But um, and you can make all the arguments you want, but I still think in the end the, the sable hair is going to be the best. But then even among sable hair, of course, I should say not everything is created equal. Uh, there's different um, types of sable hair. The best kind, at least when it comes to brushes, is Kalinsky sable. That's used for the nicest brushes out there. And then even in the Kalinsky sable, uh, the hair is graded, so the better brushes will be made from better quality uh, Kalinsky sable, basically, from better parts of the animal's tail where the hairs are more even and finer and straighter. And then you could still, you know, have a Kalinsky sable brush, basically, but it could still not be a very great brush just because the hairs are taken from an inferior location. And of course, you know, if you don't know a lot about this, all the different brush ranges, it can be difficult to 
figure out well which are good and which are bad and that's why price is a really good sort of way of figuring that out because generally if they're expensive that tells you that they've taken probably the finest most expensive most highly graded sable hair and used that in the brush because as you can might imagine um uh, fur sable hair is an expensive product. I mean, this is essentially being taken, uh, essentially a luxury product. It's being used in a very small quantity here, but it's essentially a luxury product. So it's very, very costly. Now, I mean, and I should say costly is relative here, of course, because uh, when you're buying a really tiny brush, like the kind you really need for model painting, so little of that hair is going to be used that while this brush is maybe expensive compared to other brushes of that size, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to be all that much money. I work, like, say, with number one brushes, generally, if you watch my channel. And I buy brushes that I consider to be the top of the line, sort of, they're widely acknowledged to be the best out there. And those are um, Winsor & Newton Series 7 Artist Watercolor Brushes. And yeah, and among both miniaturists and watercolor enthusiasts, basically everyone says these are the best brushes out there. They just are head and shoulders above everybody else. And I tend to agree with that. And I've seen, and because I get such good results, I've seen really no reason to experiment with anything else. But they are expensive. So number one from the Series 7 range is going to run you maybe um, 12, 13 euros for one brush. And yeah, wow, maybe for other, compared to other number one brushes, that's a lot of money. But, you know, compared to other things, 12, 13 bucks really should not be that big of an expense, especially when you consider how long these brushes will last you. Because that's another thing with these higher quality, more expensive brushes, they're a lot more durable because they're just a lot more well made, they're put together better, they're better shaped, you know, the tips are better shaped, you avoid all those problems with splitting hairs and malforming, and even if you use them for a long time, the brushes are still going to hold their shape, they're not going to wear out, they're going to perform well for you. So a brush like that, you won't have to actually replace nearly so often as you would a cheaper, less... Uh, sort of inferior quality brush. So in the end, you're probably spending about the same amount of money or actually saving money, depending on, you know, how careful you are in taking care of your brushes. So, I mean, I know some people may say, well, this, you know, is it really make that big a difference? Is it really possible that a brush is really going to have that much of an effect on how your painting comes out? Well, I mean, it won't for everybody. I mean, if you're a really skilled, experienced painter, you can probably take a shitty kind of inferior quality brush and still get really good results. But if you are a less experienced painter, um, you will be not only kind of, you'll be, lesser quality brushes are going to get in the way of you getting sort of optimal results. And the better quality brushes are just going to sort of, facilitate that. So, you know, whatever, and, and even though I could probably do pretty well with a crappy brush, probably get decent results, it's just a lot more pleasant to work with, you know, a good tool that, you know, does a good job and sort of, you know, really complements what you're trying to do. So if you have sort of cheap brushes or things that are not, you know, that amazing, I would really recommend you go out there as soon as you can, get the best brush you can afford, and try working with that. Obviously, washes are a really useful tool to miniature painters. There's a lot of great techniques out there that involve washes, and I use them a ton myself. Um, but what I'm talking about here is something I think that particularly beginners and less experienced painters do, but also maybe people who are looking to save time. And that is that you apply um, your base layer of paint, and then you just go real quick and dirty, and then you just apply a wash over top of that, and that's your finished figure. You just let the wash do all the work, uh, sort of add shading uh, in down in all the recesses, and cracks and you know you're done super duper fast or actually what's I think frankly way more tragic is you see a lot of people who will base cut the model then they'll actually highlight it with several layers and then after they're done 
they will finish their model with a wash. And I think that's the, that's really sad because you've now you've invested all this work and effort into sort of layering and applying highlights to your model. And by applying the wash as your final step, you're basically sort of negating all of that sort of layering and work you did all that time that you put in and sort of just dolling down all the colors sort of muddying things you know it, it, it sort of it's sort of it's basically contradictory to the whole highlighting process I guess so I mean what I guess I'm saying here is that I think you should always pretty much try to avoid uh, using washes as a finishing step on pretty much anything. I, I mean, and I, I actually, there is probably one exception to that, and I'm going to talk about that actually a little bit later, but don't finish any area of your model with wash being the last thing that you apply. So instead of uh, finishing your model with a wash, Here's what you should do instead. You want to go ahead and apply your base coat, and then you can go ahead again and apply a wash. And I'm using this um, uh, Old Games Workshop uh, Berserker Dwarf here as my test dummy for the rest of the video. So you apply your wash, and I use Reichland Flesh Shade here over a very sort of average flesh tone. It's neither a super dark base coat or a light color. It's just like a very average neutral flesh color with a dark wash over top of it. And this, of course, is where some people stop. I've seen people just, this is how they would paint their model. Um, and I don't really think this looks very good at all. And I understand the reason people just do it like this is it's real fast and dirty and they don't care and they want to save time and they're painting a lot of miniatures. Okay, fine. But I think you can improve this a lot with really putting in minimal extra effort. So in this next example, what I've done is I've taken that base coat, that flesh tone, and I've just waited till the wash dried and I've reapplied it over the top. There is absolutely no fancy blending or anything like that going on here. I'm not really trying to do any fancy layering techniques. I just took that paint and sort of applied it over all the high surfaces of the model, just carefully blocked it in and you know I want to make sure I left the dark wash still down in all the recesses and shaded areas obviously and I just reapplied this paint over the top. Uh, I did apply a couple coats in a couple in some places and that was just because of coverage reasons because I wasn't getting a good enough coverage so I built it up a little bit. But other than that it's really just blocking in. This doesn't require any special skill to do this. You maybe you have to be a little bit careful. You can't be super duper sloppy or anything but it doesn't require a whole bunch of extra skill. And already this model looks tremendously better than in the first example. And you could just do this and leave it like this and you would already have a much better figure. And the time that I've invested up until, or I should say the time I kind of invested in doing this extra step, maybe five to 10 minutes max, probably less than 10 minutes, honestly. And now, okay, so you did that and you want actually to improve your figure a little bit further. Now you could actually add a single highlight. And that's what I have done here. I took uh, Vallejo Flash, which is a pretty bright color, and I added an extra layer over top. And again, I didn't apply it in any sort of fancy way. I just blocked in areas of color, maybe build it up a little bit if it was too thin, and just, you know, just plot it on the areas where I wanted there to be some highlight on the model. And this is, again, just one highlight layer, okay? So, so far we have used one color as our base coat, which, and then one highlight. And then the, all our shading is coming from a wash. That's it. And this takes another little bit of time. This takes probably less time than it took, in fact, to apply that base coat um, over the wash again a minute ago, uh, because we're gonna apply it in fewer areas, in fact, because there's less areas where we really want a bright highlight. So again, this took maybe five minutes to do, maybe eight minutes, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Obviously, if you're doing a lot of these, you can probably get pretty fast at it. But now this figure is enormously improved over just that sort of base coat wash looking model. And honestly, this is a really uh, minimal uh, time investment. I mean, even if you really are in a hurry and you're trying to save time, just by doing 
this by going this far, you produced a much more attractive looking figure. And, you know, and yeah, I mean, I guess if you absolutely don't want to put any effort into your models, maybe this is not acceptable, but it is a big improvement. And it's, I think, you know, I, and I, for me, this at least demonstrates why, very clearly why you should never really finish models as your last step being a wash. So another technique that tends to get uh, kind of heavily misused for painting models is uh, dry brushing. Now, dry brushing is definitely a cheap and dirty way to highlight your model uh, without too much work. And for that reason, I think for a long time it was sort of pushed in at least some segment of the wargaming community as a good way for people who wanted to, you know, quickly get an army on the table without a lot of effort. But it has some really major drawbacks and you can already kind of guess those from the technique's name, dry brushing. It tends to make things you put it on look dry and dusty. And that is really good in some cases. So like if you're painting terrain or buildings or even vehicles, having sort of a dry, dusty highlight is a nice, pleasant looking effect. Those things also tend to be a lot bigger. And generally speaking, dry brushing as a technique is more effective the larger the the area is that you want to paint. And it also, of course, works better on items that have a lot of relief. And on some uh, 28 millimeter figures, that relief is limited. And of course, the other real big problem with applying it to the little figures is that it's pretty hard to control. Even if you use a really small brush, it's very imprecise and it's very easy to get it on parts of the model where you really uh, do not want it. So it, it is a good technique for some things, but for just sort of generally highlighting your 28 millimeter models, I would really strongly advise against it. So instead of dry brushing, what should you do? Well, uh, I would suggest you look at my last segment where I kind of talked about applying a base coat, a wash, and then one or two highlight layers over top. For most areas of a 28 millimeter figure, that is what you want to do to get the best results, or at least let's say better results. If you want to go a uh, whole hog like I often do and do a lot of blending and lots of layers, that's even better. But uh, just for even just general everyday quick army painting, uh, that technique I showed you earlier is going to be way better if you want to get highlights on your figure than dry brushing will be. Uh, that said, there are actually a few places on a 28 millimeter figure where dry brushing is useful. And the sort of rule of thumb I use for figuring that out is, is the area something that is or was part of an organic sort of living creature? So that means things like fur or feathers or hair or scales. All of those kinds of areas are suitable candidates for dry brushing. It's an effective way to highlight those areas and it tends to be really time consuming and troublesome to highlight them in another way. So here we have again that uh, dwarf berserker who we are you know, you're testing out all our techniques on today. And this first example, uh, he's been given sort of an orange base coat on his hair and beard and then I've applied a um, wash of ripened flesh shade to him, so a really, really dark tone. And then I've gone over and I have dry brushed the hair. Um, I first did a dry brush of Fire Dragon Orange uh, from Citadel, and then I took a very light dry brush of Vallejo Flesh over top of that. Obviously, those really bright dry brushes, it's very important that you don't apply very much. You make sure your brush is very dry when you put them down, and you know, but they're still very good for getting a lot of contrast really fast, and especially on the areas that you really want to be bright. Now, you can see this already looks pretty good, and this is definitely a way, 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 way faster way to paint an area like this than if you went in with a brush and highlighted every individual strand of hair. But you can already see that there is some sort of dusty, dry looking things going on as a result of the technique. And that's really not ideal because, I mean, if you think of someone's hair, hair is not usually dry and dusty, it's sleek and shiny. So that is a little bit problematic. And this is the point where 
I am going to talk about an exception that I also mentioned in the last section about never finishing them with a wash. Well, this is the one place where finishing with a wash is okay. So in this example, what I've done is I've gone ahead and just taken some serum from Sepia and applied a light wash on top of all of the hair and the beard. And what this really does here is it helps tie everything together. It unifies the color. It sort of tones down that dry, uh, dusty effect that you got from the dry brushing. And just, you know, it, it makes everything a little bit more subtle and just it just it all together improves the look of your dry brushing. And of course, the one thing you do need to remember here is a wash is a good way to fix, uh, sort of applying a wash over a dry brush is a good way to sort of really improve the look of the model further, but you need to be careful what uh, wash you use. So you don't want to use a really dark wash. I would not have gone over this again with Reichland Flush Shade like I used earlier because it would have been too dark and too intense. You're a wa when you're applying a wash over a dry brush, you want it to be a thin, um, light wash and ideally in a color that's not going to contrast too heavily with uh, what you've already applied. So Serum from Sepia is ideal here because it is not a very strong wash, at least not when you put it over orange. And also, of course, it is a color, a sort of a light brown, yellow, orange color that is very, you know, complementary to what we've already done. So this is really kind of my feeling on dry brushing. Don't use it for most things except organic surfaces. And then when you do, you are going to want to apply some kind of wash afterwards to kind of tone down the dry dusty effect. So this next one is probably a little bit more advanced. Uh, I see something that people struggle with a lot on models is painting patterns. And patterns are difficult, and there are a lot of things there that you need to practice and good, get good at, really, to uh, be successful. But I think one of the sort of fundamental reasons that I see people failing who otherwise have good skills is that they get too caught up in this notion of making sure that whatever pattern they're painting is perfectly in scale with the model that they're working on. And I'm going to use um, camouflage patterns here as my example because those are something people really commonly want to paint on miniatures. And so you get somebody who takes a 28 millimeter model and they want, and they take their camo pattern and they think, well, I have to reduce this pattern so all the shapes and elements of it are in scale with something that's 28 millimeters tall. Now, if you do this, you're not going to get good results. I can guarantee you, I don't care how good a painter you are, you will always get bad results because you cannot, even if you were some kind of robot or something, if you painted the pattern perfectly at that scale, it would be it would be so tiny that you wouldn't be able to tell what it was anymore. It would just be a muddled, uh, muddy mess, and, you, and all the details recommend recognizability of that pattern would just get lost. So what you really want to do instead is you want to take your pattern and you want to sort of break it down to its most important elements. You want to figure out what makes it what it is. So take, say, World War II German splinter pattern camouflage. You want to look at that and you say, what are the elements, what are the aspects of this that makes it unmistakably a splinter pattern? Makes me go, whoa, that splinter pattern, I would know it anywhere. So you have to figure those things out first, and then you need to try to reproduce them on your figure, and you need to be keeping two things in mind. First, that um, you don't want it to be too small, obviously, because as we've just said, if you get too caught up or trapped in that idea of keeping it in perfect scale, you're going to lose the patterns, you, the ability to even distinguish the elements of the pattern. At the same time, of course, you don't want to make it too, too, too big because you need to have enough sort of variation in the area that you're painting to really clearly show it is. If it's too big, then you're only going to be able to work in a few elements of that pattern and it won't be immediately obvious what you're painting. So you need to sort of get sort of hit that sort of sweet spot. But the point is the scale that you're painting your pattern in is not true to life by um, any means. I, I want to show you an example here. This is a, um, a sort of a model 
a German here figure that I painted uh, wearing a splinter pattern. And this is, you know, obviously, if you think about it, this is not in scale at all. But I personally at least find that this creates a pleasant effect. It's clear that this guy is wearing splinter pattern, and it looks good on the model. It looks nice on the tabletop. You know, it, it checks all the boxes, basically. Uh, and now, just to give you, to sort of underscore my point about why that scale, getting trapped in that whole idea of keeping things at scale is problematic, I'm going to take an actual sort of uh, photograph here of a World War II German scale of, or German, sorry, a German soldier here, wearing uh, the splinter patterns. This, this is, this, we can be 100% sure that this pattern is perfectly in scale with the model. So now I'm going to go ahead and see here, I'm going to shrink this, I'm going to sort of cut this out, and I'm going to shrink it down so it's about the same height as the uh, model and, you know, put the two side by side. And um, obviously the proportions are going to be a little bit different because, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about a real person here versus uh, a model. But, okay, so, and so, wow, you can basically see. So this is a real person uh, wearing perfectly in scale uh, splinter pattern. <laughs> And you can see what happens if we take him and we make him 28 millimeters tall. And you can imagine, you know, if you had him on the tabletop, you can see that just even doing that. And this is sort of a, basically we can assume this is our sort of ideal um, situation. This doesn't look good anymore. You would look at this and go, you know, I don't get what this is. If you, if you were looking at this and it was 28 millimeters tall on, in front of you, you go, that looks bad. That's that's not good looking splinter pattern anymore. So this this should give you an idea why just trying to think purely in times of purely in terms of size is not a good way to approach painting uh, camouflage or really any other patterns on your model. I mean, and so then of course how do you determine what the right size is? Well I discussed that a little bit, but of course the best way to learn this is to find examples by other painters that you like, where you think it was effective, you think it was successful, you like how it looks on their model, and copy that. Look how big they painted the elements of the pattern and paint your elements a similar size. And that's, and then if you do that for a while, you'll start to learn, you'll start to get a feel for what looks good and what looks bad and when you're too small and when you're too big. And you can, you know, you can adjust that a little bit. And after a while, it'll just be easier even when you are dealing with uh, a brand new pattern that you've never worked with before to kind of estimate what a good size is for the various elements. So this last thing I want to talk about is probably going to be contentious and it's very much a matter of personal taste. So I know some people are not going to agree with my assessment of this, but one thing that I think a uh, big mistake is that even very advanced, otherwise very skilled ma painters make is that they try to paint eyes on their models and they don't end up looking very good. And um, of course, if you've seen any of my tutorials earlier, you know that I very rarely paint eyes. I usually just indicate where they are with some sh sort of shadows and highlights of the lid and kind of leave it at that. But at some point, I don't know where it came from, that I think there's this sort of perception has got into the community that, at least for some people, being able to paint eyes on your model is somehow an indicator or a mark of your skill as a painter. That if you can do that, that proves that you're a good painter because that is somehow hard or difficult or, you know, that, that's some kind of skill test, I guess. And uh, the problem is a lot of people just do that, but they don't really stop and think very critically, I think, about how it actually makes their figure look and whether those eyes actually are appropriate looking, realistic looking, uh, in scale with the rest of the figure. They just get sort of wrapped up in this idea, well, if I can put eyes on my figure, then that shows that I'm an amazing painter and, you know, the, the rest, you know, it, it, it just becomes sort of this litmus test that I don't think actually says very much about um, 
anything. Uh, and here is an example. I just wanted to show you. I've taken uh, my dwarf again here, and I have painted eyes on him in the way that you see an awful, awful lot of people doing it. And that is you just take sort of a big white area, and then you put a big black circle in it. Maybe it has some dark outline around it. But the overall effect you see here, it, it's, it's very doll-like. It's very artificial looking. It certainly doesn't contribute to the sort of um, feeling of a realistic figure. And it all really goes along with what I talked about just a little bit ago in terms of scale. You know, we're talking about patterns and trying to paint things too small. Well, this is a mistake people make going the other way. They paint an eye on a figure that's completely out of scale. It's way, way, way too large and out of proportion with uh, the rest of the model. And that's why it looks so strange. So this is, this is one thing that I really, really, <laughs> this is one of my, definitely one of the things that one of my pet peeves, I think, more than any of the other mistakes that people make because it's so often made by people who I think are otherwise good painters and I just don't see very much excuse for this. And I know, as I said, that some people actually like how this looks. And I guess for me, that's totally incomprehensible. I mean, to each their own, but I think it's possible to uh, do a lot better, honestly. So you can probably already guess that I'm going to say that instead of trying to paint eyes on figures, what you should do instead is not paint eyes on figures. And here, of course, is an example of our dwarf. And I have painted him in the way I usually do most of my tutorial figures when it comes to eyes. So I've used black, red, and flesh tone from Vallejo to indicate like shading and an eyelid and all that kind of stuff. But I haven't actually tried to fill in the eye. And this... Uh, maybe it's not as good as it could be, but for most sort of normal run-of-the-mill figures, even ones that are painted to a pretty high standard, this will give you a good effect, and it will not take you very long. That's the important thing. It's it's a fairly efficient looking, and you know I've done a lot of models, and I this way I, if you've seen my videos, and people generally tend to think they look good, so you can take that as maybe some endorsement of why. It's perfectly fine to paint your models without actually uh, painting in eyeballs. And I think this is the kind of technique you should be aiming for 99% uh, of the time. Now, I've, as for that other 1%, that is when you want to do a model that you're going to enter in a painting competition or you want to be some really showpiece of your collection. And here is an example, again, now of the dwarf where I've actually taken the time and effort to try to paint a good looking eye on the model or okay so this could be better and a lot of getting a good eye is just constantly refining and tweaking it and adjusting it till it looks right till the proportions are good till you feel like it fits on the face but the main difference you should see here right away between uh, this and the cartoony eye is the proportion of white to dark uh, the cartoony eyes are mostly fail because they have way too much of white of the eye showing and it doesn't look realistic especially uh, at, at 28 millimeters and the eyes themselves are generally too big just too big out of proportion with the figure so you can see here the pupil is a lot bigger there's a lot more shadow around the outside of the eye there's the more darker lining there's a lot more emphasis on that and the white part is relatively small and of course keep in mind too that this is a rather heroically proportioned cartoony looking figure so he has unusually large uh, kind of strange looking eyes. Anyway, this gets even more tricky on a more realistically proportioned sort of, uh, um, you know, historical type uh, 28 millimeter figure. That, that then the eyes can be really, really difficult. So this is, this is still a fairly easy figure to paint the eyes on. And even when you're applying white, you don't really want it to be white white because bright white won't give you too much contrast. It'll make the figure look scared or unnatural. So what you're really aiming for with the white areas anyway is more of a neutral or sort of a dark gray or even one with a little bit of uh, brown or red mixed into it to tone that down. And obviously I'm not going to give you a step-by-step -step tutorial on how I achieve that, this and I honestly am not sure that I could make a video like that because painting eyes, there are so many variables in it. There's not really a step one, step two, step three, step four, step five that will always consistently give you good looking eyes because it is so heavily dependent on 
the attitude, the pose of the figure you're painting, the size of the figure you're painting, the sculpting quality of the figure you're painting, uh, sort of the direction that the figure is looking, you know, whether he's wearing a hat, whether he's got hair. There are so many different things that can affect how you have to go about painting the eyes on the figure. And getting good at it, it's really just experience. What I do and how I've kind of gotten the where I am as far as eye painting is concerned is just looking at eyes a lot. Just like any other artistic pursuit, you need to observe a lot the thing that you're trying to paint and see how it looks and constantly, and, and as you paint, constantly be evaluating your work and seeing, does this look right? Does this look in proportion? Is this realistic looking? Does this make sense? And then adjust it accordingly. Um, until it does. And of course the other thing you can do is find examples of miniature painters who do eyes in a way that you do like and try your best to sort of uh, copy their effects. But again, a lot of painting eyes uh, is experience and practice and just having a feel for when it seems right um, and when it doesn't seem right. And that is, I think, far, 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 far harder to learn than just uh, making a white dot and putting a black dot in the center because that isn't really showing necessarily that you're a good painter. It's just showing that you have a reasonable level of brush control and you can paint something small. Uh, I think a mark of a really good painter is going to be someone who can uh, uh, maybe know how to paint an eye but really knows when is an appropriate time to do it and when is not an appropriate time to do it. And doesn't, you know, just hold it up as some absolute for showing how good they are at painting. Okay, so that was five common mistakes I think people make when they're painting and some things you can try to do about them. And of course, I know that not everybody is going to agree with this list, uh, either the problems that I bring up or my kind of solutions for them. And that's perfectly okay. This is a very personal thing and there are a lot of different ways to get good results and you know good of course is even subjective because it's really what makes you happy in the end that counts and I think that's actually the biggest mistake that people make when they're painting they listen too much to what other people say makes a good model or how other people say you should or shouldn't paint something and they don't spend enough time thinking about you know what they like in a figure and what you know makes them happy and what satisfies them whether that is painting to an extremely high standard like to enter in a competition or it's just uh, slapping some paint on a model cheap and cheerful and you know getting it out there to play you have to figure out what works for you what makes you happy and you know and not, and not get, be too influenced by you know what other people think and because developing a style in your work even if you kind of learn from others and always try to get better. Developing your own, you know, personal, unique style, I think, is how, in the end, you're going to kind of get the most satisfaction out of this hobby. So, if you enjoyed this video, uh, please like it, uh, share it, do leave me comments, of course, with what you thought. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of those. And if you haven't gotten a chance to do so already, please subscribe to my channel so you can continue getting updates on all of these crazy rants and videos I make. And uh, I will see you next time.